All right, thank you, Brother Ralph. Is the volume suitable on this? Everything is good, brother. All right. Well, um, my talk is Satan's influence on mankind. And to begin with, I want to read from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, 8, 9, and 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. When reading the scripture, I wonder what Satan has a short time for. Is it a short time to influence man, or does he know he has only a short time to live? I wonder if he knew that he only had seven days to live. That, of course, would be 7,000 years in man's way of keeping time. I really don't know what Satan knew at that time, but I do know that he was on the earth while Adam and Eve were still in the Garden of Eden, as evidenced in the Genesis account of their creation. For all I know, Satan could have been on the earth before Adam and Eve were created. He may have even witnessed their creation, but again, I do not know if he did or not. I do know that he was there to influence Eve, and through her, he was able to also influence Adam. In Genesis 2-7, we read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. In Genesis 2, 21 through oh, yeah. 23, yeah. we read, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and God took one of Adam's, one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from the man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. Genesis 2, 9. And out of the ground God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. As a side note, I think this answers the age old question of what came first, the chicken or the egg. The way I read the scripture tells me the chicken came first. And I'd also like to mention a personal observation about the creation of Adam and Eve. And I want to stress very strongly that this is just a personal observation and nothing more. Um, in verse 7, it says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And in verses 21 and 22, it says, the Lord God formed the woman from a rib taken from Adam. To me, this means that Adam and Eve were the original prototypes of the human race that all others would be patterned after. They were endowed with the ability to procreate and or give live birth to their offspring, such as Cain and Abel. And, they were, and Cain and Abel would be what I would call the production models. They too were endowed with the ability to procreate one of the differences between Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel is Adam and Eve do not have belly buttons, whereas Cain and Abel do have belly buttons. This shows the creation of Cain and Abel is vastly different from the creation of Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel received oxygen through the blood of Eve in gestation. Not only did Eve have to eat for two, she also had to breathe for two. As an illustration of this point, I will quote from Luke 1, 39 through 44. 
And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into a house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. This account is why I think of birth as live birth. To me, it seems as though John was pretty lively in the womb and also demonstrated a degree of perception of the outside world, whereas Adam knew nothing until that breath of life was breathed into his nostrils. This is the difference between the prototypes and the production models. And one last example is when a person's heart stops beating, the person is considered to be dead. If by CPR or electric shock, the heartbeat can be restored, the person is considered to be alive. And we all know that babies in their mother's womb have a heartbeat in about six weeks after conception. So, Let's move on now. I don't want to labor the point, pun intended. It is time to focus on the main character in this narrative. To do so, I'll start with Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, some way, somehow, Satan was aware of the commandment given to Adam and Eve. Now, I say this based on what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11.3, and I quote, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Also based on Revelation 20, verse 2, and he said, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Next, I'll read Genesis 3, 1 through 7, where Satan completely flips the script and poses the, as the truth teller and thereby insinuates that the Lord God is a liar, as we read. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, and the Lord God made and said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. And boom, right there, right here, we have the first lie ever told. And as the apostle John tells us in John 8, 44, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Genesis 3, 5, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed leaves, sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So here we have it, the first lie ever told, the first sin ever committed, the fall of mankind into sin and death. Remember in Revelations 12, 9, where it names that old serpent called the devil, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, well, when Adam and Eve broke the one commandment that God gave to them and ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were the whole world at that time. Of course, the scripture has a 
wider and more literal meaning as well. Then in the fourth chapter of Luke, we can read about our Lord Jesus being tempted by the devil 40 days in the wilderness. Then the devil wanted Jesus to turn stones into bread. Then the de devil in Luke 4 verse 5 takes Jesus up into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. From these scriptures in Luke, we can see that Satan was already in possession of all the kingdoms of the world. This is still true today, as we often acknowledge that we live in the present evil world where sin has been permitted for a set amount of time. At this point in the stream of time, it does appear that Satan's evil worldwide empire is beginning to shake. His grip and power on power is beginning to weaken. People around the world are taking to the streets to protest corrupt governments. That is to say, Satan influenced governments worldwide. From Afghanistan to Zimbabwe and many in between, such as Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Iran, Israel, Netherlands, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, Spain, United Kingdom, United States, Venezuela, and this is the short, the short list. It appears to me that the shaking has begun. In Hebrews 12, 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Haggai 2, 6 and 7, for this saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. So far in this talk, we have uh, considered uh, Adam and Eve being tempted by the devil. Then we talked about Jesus being tempted by the devil. Next, I'd like to talk about Job being tempted by the devil. And in Job 1, 14 through 19, we read, and there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them and the Sabines fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said the Chaldeans made of three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only am escaped to tell thee. Then in Job 2, 4, and Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life, but pour, put forth thy hand now and touch his bone and flesh and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So, uh, so, so went, Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job, Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And Job took him a pot sheared to scrape himself with, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. 
In order to make a long story short, I'm going to quote from the last chapter of Job, from chapter 42, verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord has spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have spoken of me the thing. You have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. And then in verse 12, uh, so the Lord blessed the later end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. After this lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being full of days. The grief that Job endured is probably beyond our comprehension. And he never cursed God in spite of all the cruelty he endured at the hand of Satan. The story of Job should be an inspiration to us all. And next, we will leave the scriptures and I wanna share three short stories from my own life. One from childhood, one as a teenager and one as a young adult. And the first story begins when I was about eight years old. I lived in a small town called Pedley, which is located in Southern California. For a reference in time, this would have been 1958. There was an old man that lived a few streets over from where I lived. I don't remember his name, but I do remember that he lived alone in a small house and didn't get out much. One summer day, I went by to visit the old man and the door was closed and he wasn't out and about. So I started looking in through the windows. When I looked through the kitchen window, I could see him slumped over the kitchen table face down in a bowl in front of him. The sight of him scared me and I ran to tell my Aunt Lorraine as she was the only adult not at work at the time. She called the police and everything was taken care of. The experience left me profoundly puzzled as to why God that I always instinctively believed in why would he give us a taste of life and then take it away? It made no sense to me. I was angry and I wanted an explanation from God, but God never spoke a word to me. My mom couldn't answer the, my question either. And uh, God wouldn't answer the question. I didn't know my dad at the time. I had no memory of him. He was not around. He was no help. So I was deeply troubled by this mystery well into my teens. When I was 17 years old, I met a girl in high school named Lori Detzler. Through her, I met my future fa father-in-law, Brother Jack Detzler. I quickly found out that Lori's dad knew a thing or two about the Bible. He would talk and I would listen. And after a while, I began to learn a little bit about the mysteries that haunted me. When I was 18, I joined the Navy and went to boot camp in San Diego, California. That was in November of 1968. My conversations with Jack were pretty much canceled for the next four years. The next story, next short story begins at the Marine base at Camp Pendleton, which is located along the coast in Southern California. I was 19 at the time when I was to be at Camp Pendleton for three weeks of training. The training was broken up into three parts. The first week was for language training and weapons training. We learned some basic Vietnamese words so that we had some ability to communicate in this language. The weapons training covered everything from the 45 caliber pistol to the M16 to the 50 caliber machine gun. And we were taught the proper way to throw a hand grenade. All of this was great fun at this point. The next week was about land navigation and survival. At the beginning, I weighed 165 pounds, I was six feet tall and in pretty good shape. In the second week, all the training was done out in the field. During that week, I ate snake, watercress, a little bit of soup. We were constantly on the move and sleeping under the stars. Then the third week was spent in a simulated prisoner of war camp where I was waterboarded and abused in many ways locked in boxes, 
made to assume and hold difficult positions, but the worst was going inside an interrogation hut to be interrogated by a little brown man in black pajamas. He would try to get me to confess to war crimes. Every method was employed to force me to submit to his will, both psychological and physical. I was beaten with an open hand during that week until my face was swollen and black and blue. During these last two weeks, my weight went from 165 pounds down to 145 pounds. The little brown men in black pajamas were never able to force me to submit, and I successfully passed the training. And while we were in the POW camp, we had official guidance on what we could say. We were allowed to give the enemy our name, rank, and serial number. Any other questions posed to us were answered with the same response, which was, my country does not allow me to answer that question. So the point of all this was to learn what it's like to live with the enemy and what our proper conduct should be if we were ever captured. And years later, I look back on this training and recognize that there were similarities between this and my walk as a baptized, Christ, consecrated, believing Christian. And this brings us to the third short story. I became how I became a baptized, consecrated, believing Christian. For this, we jump ahead to 1972. Lori and I got married that year. And shortly after that, I got an honorable discharge from the Navy. The conversations began again with my father-in-law. By 1976, Lori and I were baptized during a lunch break from a convention at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles, California. The old LA class was there and the Riverside class was there to witness Lori and I be baptized by Brother Jack Detzler. And by now I had learned enough so that most of the questions that haunted me were now answered between my father-in-law and brother Russell and by the grace of God, I finally had some wisdom, knowledge and understanding of the truth. But then came the battle of trying to live with the enemy. That is to say how to be of the world, but not part of the world, learning the appropriate conduct in both word and action. I learned that I had many shortcomings and many habits and things that had to be overcome. A new struggle began and it continues to this day. Satan's influence permeates all societies on earth. Mankind has fallen and is under the influence of Satan, some to a lesser degree and some to a greater degree, including myself. Now I am fighting with the enemy who wants me to submit to his will, and I stubbornly stick to name, rank, and serial number as best I can. And that serial number, by the way, is B861173. To everything else, my Father in heaven does not allow me to do or say what the devil demands of me. And as it turns out, I actually did better in those three weeks of SEER school than I do in my Christian walk. The acronym SEER stands for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. Now here in 2023, I'm still fighting the enemy and Lori is still by my side, steady as she goes. Now I want to return to the scriptures. I want to talk a little more about John 8:44, especially the first part where it says, and I quote, "Ye are the father of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. So let's think about this for a moment. Who were the first recorded murder victims? In my mind, the first murder victims were Adam and Eve. I believe Satan knew full well that if Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. He deliberately concocted a lie to entice Eve to eat the fruit thereof, all the while knowing what the consequence of her actions would be. Remember that Satan speaking through the serpent lied to Eve and told her, you will not surely die. Eve believed the devil's lie and did eat, and then Adam did eat. Something else, else also occurred in this disobedience by our first parents. 
Adam and Eve had not yet had any children. They were evicted from the Garden of Eden before having children, but the penalty for sin had been pronounced before they were forced from the Garden. When Adam and Eve did have children, those children inherited the death penalty from their parents, even as all of us have inherited the death penalty. The very next recorded murder is when Adam, um, sorry, is when Cain murdered his brother Abel. As near as I can tell, the murder of Abel was motivated by jealousy. The murders and death by all causes have continued unabated ever since. Joyfully for, other, for us, Brother Jerry has already outlined the remedy for all the sorrow, sickness, and dying. The sad part is that we're not there yet. Rather, we seem to be right where the Apostle Matthew talks about in Matthew 26, I mean 24, 6 through 8, which reads, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See, ye, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for the nation, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. We do what we do read about. What do we, <laughs> what do we read about in the news at the present time? The war in Ukraine. Now there is fear of the war spreading and turning into a nuclear war that will possibly involve America and even Europe. There are rumors that China may invade Taiwan and rumors that China and Russia may become allies in what might be possibly be World War III. Here in America, we've had a series of fires and explosions at various food processing plants. We've had train derailments and fires. The one in Ohio had, was set on fire and the smoke from that fire has polluted the la air, land and water all the way to the East Coast and part of Canada. The new cycle seems to go from crisis to crisis. Then we have Klaus Schwab. <laughs> Probably the, the devil himself practically, but anyhow, Klaus Schwab founded the World Economic Forum. He is somewhat famous for telling the world that you will own nothing and be happy. Yeah. And he also thinks we'll eat bugs as part of a large part of our diet. And interestingly, in a recent speech at the World Government Summit, Klaus Schwab stated from the podium, and I quote, energy systems, food systems, and supply chain systems will be deeply affected. We will destroy, unfortunately, a lot of employment. Then another speaker followed Claus and went on to explain that humans will be hackable animals and they will re-engineer life itself by intelligent design. And this guy says, not intelligent design by some God above the clouds, but by our intelligent design. Then Claus comes back and finishes up by saying that synthetic biology and technology will change civilization and those who are masters of that technology will be the masters of the world. Schwab has also said that there will be a series of black swan events to help bring about the new world order, that we will go from crisis to crisis. These people are ready to destroy the earth, well, destroy everything, so that they can rule over the ashes. And then we also have the Federal Reserve Bank in America and the central banking systems all around the world who are getting ready to introduce the central bank digital currency worldwide, or the CBDC as they like to refer to it. They will eliminate cash and will control our money and how and where we can spend it. If we get out of line, they can turn it off. They also want to implement 15 minute cities. You will have everything you need within 15 minutes of the smart city that you live in. We are talking about total control of the human race, or as I like to think of it is hell on earth. The Federal Reserve Bank is a privately owned for-profit banking system and their business model is a simple one. 
it can be summed up in three words, lie, steal, kill. Their only product is debt. They must issue more debt every day to stay alive. The billions of dollars that America sends to Ukraine makes the Fed ever more powerful. They love never ending wars as it makes them ever more powerful. If they can issue ever increasing debt, they will fail. The evil that is at work on this planet right now may only have its equal in the days before the flood. We live in historic times and also a time of change. The wicked are going for their final solution to make the world according to their will. At the same time, we know that in Matthew 24, verse 12, the scriptures tell us, except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And brethren, the final thought that I'd like to leave you with is this. Holiness is the next frontier for mankind, and nothing can stop us from getting there. The kingdom will come. And that wraps up my uh, little talk here. And I want to thank you, brethren, for sharing this little bit of time with me. Um, God bless you all. Thank you, Brother Ralph.